Based in Santa Monica, California, Digital Music News, aka DMN, has been delivering music industry news and analysis for over a decade and now has more than a million readers each month. Joining me today to share a few insights into the business end is Paul Reznikoff, DMN's founder and publisher, and I think French horn player. Found somewhere. Also joining is author and analyst Ashley King. Welcome to both of you. Hi, happy to be here. Yeah, nice to be here. Yeah, great. I'm glad that you could join. Um, first of all, Paul, do you take requests on your French horn? Um, you know, I do. Here's the problem. So the problem with French horn is if you're not really practicing, and I mean daily, you are really it's a risky bet and um i have definitely walked the streets playing french horn and i specifically select because i'm not really practicing every day these days and uh so i pick out pieces that are you know reasonable not not that challenging and i've definitely played in the streets and done okay but more complex things you know give me a few months Okay, so I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you to play something for us right now. <laughs> well, I, to my um, saving me is that my French horn is uh, two and a half miles away. So it's, it's impossible. Okay, well, shame about that. I should have prepared you a bit better, yeah. shouldn't I? Um, so, Paul, let's start at the beginning, hey? So um, why a news music industry news delivery service and how did it all start? Yeah, uh, this the story is uh, pretty um, organic, actually. So I've been I was in the music industry on the tech side before I started Digital Music News. And at the inception of tech in music, when it was first bubbling, it was actually really just hard to to figure out who the players were. And it didn't matter if you were um, someone working in tech, trying to interface with tech, starting um, something tech related, uh, most mostly downloads in the early days um, or an investor or anyone trying to interface it was really difficult to figure out who the players were, what the trends were, what people were into, what the research was. It was pretty decentralized. So the idea really was just an aggregation uh, email that I put together really for about 20 people who were trying to sort of make their way or figure out if they wanted to, to do something in the space. And then that I knew I was onto something because that kept growing. People kept I didn't have uh, any type of bulk email service or anything. I was doing it all from my uh, personal email. And I just kept getting requests to add more and more people. And I was like cutting and pasting this increasingly giant list of emails and then hitting spam filters because I'm sending a thousand emails at a time. And so, yeah, it, it, just, it just kept growing and growing into something that evolved into a trade publication. Right. And how many names did you come up with before you landed on digital music news? Uh, that was might have been the first one. And I just remember it was ages ago. I was at my parents' place for the holidays and I was on um, Name Secure or something like that. I was just typing in one or two and boom, there it came and I reserved it. Went downstairs, ate something, came back up and I was like, oh, I'll make some cider on that. And that was it. Oh, that's it? I thought you went through a million <laughs> names to get to that. I will tell you something. Back in the day, you could actually get URLs. That is that is a difference. Up until about, I would say maybe 15 years ago, there you could still get certain names, but now it's it's really really hard to get a name that that you want. Even back then, every every common name was taken. So everything like music.com or um, I don't know, downloads.com, download.com, pets.com, everything was already taken. But then the two word, three word names are still some availability there. The land grab hadn't been completely um, finished. And so, yeah, so I kind of grabbed one of the last available ones. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. And if you were thinking about that name today, you'd have to maybe put a double L on digital, a, a Z <laughs> or a Z on news, something like that, right? Yeah, well, it's it's crazy because um, you know Ashley, you could probably add a lot more to this, but I would say that there was this this period in which the website and the URL were just this absolute preeminent things. This pre app, pre alt, alt uh, other platforms, and if you couldn't get the URL to fit a name, like you just 
that wouldn't be a good idea to name your business something where the URL went to something in Sandusky, Ohio. So uh, yeah, and I think that might have something to do with why so many companies are coming out with names that were like, what is that word? Like, I don't know. Yeah, I think that started happening really seriously around the Web 2.0 phase, which is around 2009, 2008, which is right about when you founded Digital Music News. So yeah. you, you're probably right that you got in on the last good domain. I, I, I'm so certain of that. Yeah. Well, speaking of words, Ashley, do you remember what your first word was? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> I don't. I actually don't. That's such a good question. I, I don't remember, though. <laughs> <laughs> You might have to check with the source. Uh, yes, that I will. <laughs> yeah, and then what report. about you, Victoria? What was your first word? I'm really curious. It, well, I don't know. I didn't expect to be asked that question. I was just <laughs> asking it. <laughs> I have no idea. It was probably help or something like that. <laughs> oh, really? Um, so, Ashley, I wanted to ask you. You know that saying, "A writer writes." I'm sure mm -hmm. you've heard that before. Is that especially true for you? Have you always been writing? Uh, yeah, I got my start in the digital news uh, industry in 2009, right around the same time Paul was. But while he was founding a site, I was helping someone else found a site. So that was sort of the connection there. And I did that for six years before I even made a connection with Paul. I've only been working with Paul for about three years now, but it's been an awesome partnership. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, we're glad you're over at DMN then. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the other guys miss you, whoever they oh, are. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, and also, apart from the music industry where you write prolifically, mm -hmm. uh, you're also very immersed in the gaming industry. And my question is, how did you become a leading Nintendo Switch expert? Uh, that started way before the Nintendo Switch was even a thing. I wrote extensively for a website that's now defunct called Wii U Daily, which was the console before Nintendo released the Switch. So I got my start even before the Switch became a thing. And when the Wii U was phasing out, I thought, well, having a site around Wii U is just not, you know, founding around a certain console when it only has a seven to eight year lifespan. It's not a good thing. So when I founded my personal site, I went with a, just a generic Nintendo site so that I could cover, continue to cover it as we progressed. So it looks like you're a trendsetter, huh? Yeah. Um, and how about the analyst side of you? Do you, Does that really play a role when you actually do your writing just naturally or do you have some go-to tools that you use a lot? Um, I will admit I am still a big proponent of RSS feeds and getting in on early news because you will see things in the news that don't make it mainstream that then six months later explode and you had your ear to the ground and you knew about it before everybody else did. And that has happened to me quite frequently. So I still have a collection of RSS feeds that I monitor daily. Oh, very good. I will definitely give a huge shout out to RSS feeds. I've noticed that. Yeah, actually, I've noticed that people just don't really use RSS, but it's such a great aggregation tool. I think it just sort of became less fashionable technologically google kind of killed that when they killed uh g reader which died in 2014 2015 i think and so it's kind of been on a downtrend since then and there are some projects that keep it alive but man it's such a great news aggregation tool it yeah. really is but it's it's amazing because i've now just i've had conversations with uh many people quite quite much younger than me who have no idea what rss is mm -hmm. and it just never Never cross generations, but I it, it baffles me a little bit because it the practicality is is, is just so great for what you and I do. Mm -hmm. Are we time stamping ourselves right now, guys? Knowing about Iris. Oh, time. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I will date just, myself just a bit, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I will continue to date myself throughout. Yeah, and me too. And I'm sure I outrank you guys by a lot. Um, no, no, so I don't think so. Let's, let's, talk about, <laughs> uh, um, let's talk about the wiring of a writer. Um, I'm really interested in what you think about this. Um, for someone to be a solid writer, what do you think um, it takes in the wiring? And is there a real difference when it's news style writing? Uh, either of you can take that one. You know, I think it really depends on what kind of writing you are engaged in it's a uh, and not to say you can't jump from different formats of course but i have 
heard uh, that the novelist is oftentimes um, tends to the successful novelist oftentimes is a personality type that isn't so comfortable engaging in social interactions, needs a lot of um, alone time and likes to be isolated or even has social anxieties. Sometimes it's the perfect um, way to really express oneself without having to constantly interface and work with people. Um, whereas I you know on our side with what Ashley and I are doing, there's just a lot of interaction. There's a lot of back and forth. There's like, you know, deciding who's going to do what, not to mention everything beyond just what we're, we're putting in print. So Ashley, I don't know if you, uh, you thought about that. Um, there is a difference between news writing and doing more long form pieces where you dive into the specifics of something. For news writing, you really have to have a passion about what you're doing, because if you're not projecting that passion in your writing, if you're not showing your readers that you care about the things that you're writing about, they will pick up on it like that. They will know about it and they know you don't care. And so why would they continue to read you if you don't project that passion? And I've seen a lot of people who stay in an industry maybe longer than they should have and have lost a little bit of that passion and readers quickly pick up on that. Yeah, uh, that really translates across all careers as well. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. And do you think a natural sense of curiosity is just a, a must have? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you have to be curious about all aspects of the industry, even parts that you maybe don't know as well. Whereas I'm more focused towards gaming and tech and where those uh, two industries intersect. That's my expertise. And if I don't have expertise on something that I need, I can go to Paul and say, hey, I don't know much about this. What do you know? And he can give me a synopsis that will help me better understand the thing that I'm writing about. Right. And Paul, yeah. do you, you know, do you curiosity is, is essential, but I, I would say it's it's a frustrating uh, it's frustrating chasing curiosity because it leads to dead ends. It mm -hmm. constantly slaps you back in the face with a reminder of how little you actually know. And everything is there's 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 the, the the landscape that we cover bleeds into beyond music into all sorts of different types of media, whether it's gaming, film, television, and then beyond sports. And wow, it is a complex world out there. And so you go down these uh, curiosity uh, adventures, and you're like, wow, in some ways, it's extremely stimulating because you're 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 discovering new things, learning new things. That's great. That's fantastic. And then you come back and you, you're just, you, you're humbled, I think. Yeah. And then you remember you have a deadline and go, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so then uh, do you have any, any tips that surface that we can share with people out there who would love to become a writer, particularly in the music industry, let's say? Yeah, actually, um, I, I just think the first thing is to write, to to absolutely and constantly write, even if you are not in in a in a position where your pieces are going to be published or at least published for a large scale audience. Um, there is there is no substitute for just being in the paint and just writing all the time. It will you'll you'll subconsciously start ironing out all these different issues. Your flow will will improve, um, and now there are really a lot of tools they're they're sort of in their infancy but there are a lot of tools that can help you um get a mirror to your writing and figure out um if sentence structures are, are going to connect quickly um it, it gives you a sense of you know if you're putting something out there and you're publishing you can get a sense for what types of styles or what what writing habits or topics connect the best so yeah just just writing is is absolutely essential <laughs> non-stop yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. And that this is my tool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not that I'm promoting drinking everyone out there. Yeah. But just settle down. Um, Ashley, what about you? Did you want to like add to um sort of building on what Paul was saying, uh practicing writing is important, but you should also practice writing in the right voice for communicating online because people online want to read active voice. They don't want to feel like they're being told a story or they weren't uh reading something that is happening right now so being really sure that you're using active voice as much as you can in your writing while you're developing that skill is really very important about in any industry where you're writing online yeah that's a really good tip mm -hmm. um and the thing is you guys are usually reporting and asking the questions 
um, and now that you're on the other side, do you think that being interviewed really should be part of the training syllabus for a journalist? To be on the other side. Yeah. Do, do you think that every writer and every journalist should experience being interviewed? Yeah. I, um, it, it's good because I think uh, as when you're on the other side of the table, you definitely get a different perspective. One thing is when, when I interview also, I just by simply asking questions in real time through our podcast or through an interview, I just realize I need to get to the point. I need to make sure the question is understood. And then, yeah. And then the other side, it just helps. It, it, it instantly helps my ability to tease out the topic if I'm on the other side. So sure. Yeah. Do you agree, Ashley? I do. I, I have some experience with podcasting, not with Paul, but previously. And I really do think that helps you in so many ways. Welcome back, everybody. We're here with Paul Resnikoff and Ashley King from Digital Music News, and we're now going to dive into some industry truths. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Paul, what's the general attitude of music journalists towards the music industry and their audiences, in your opinion? That's going to vary, I think, tremendously depending on who the writer is. There's a huge range, and I've I've seen many different types of attitudes, uh, good and bad, good and bad. There's, there's the writer who is starstruck, the blinding lights. It's, it's all about getting close to the celebrity, not judging that that's a style. Um, you see that that works extremely well, uh, for, for a lot of, of journalism that focus on focuses on the celebrity side, kind of the sizzle of it. And for that writer, it's, it's just a joy to get, get as close as they can to the action. Then there's on the other um, side of the spectrum, there's more of the um, heavily analytical writer. And that can, that can go one of two ways. One that can be really great, really insightful, but then there can also be this, this sort of, um, I don't know if you'd call it cynicism, but there's, there's a, a tendency to start to see the industry a lot more behind the scenes. So it, it you see a lot of, um, a lot of trends, a lot of patterns repeating. Uh, so you, you sort of lose a little bit of touch um, with the, the consumer side of the industry, and that can go in a bad direction. I've definitely seen that um, happen. So yeah, it can go, it can go all over the place. Mm. Ashley, do you agree? I do. I try. He's mentioning about analysts and I try to stay on both sides of that because if I get too deep into it, I can do exactly what Paul said and, and get a little bit more cynical about things. Uh, one topic to mention is TikTok. TikTok's all the rage now. It's the biggest, one of the biggest short form video sites in the world. Um, but it's basically a rehashed idea from 2014. It's Vine. So <laughs> Vine's popular again. It's just called TikTok now. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm sad for Vine. Then it got mm-hmm. docked out. Did it to themselves. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, you've written this over and over again. I mean, they killed it themselves. They did. <laughs> they absolutely did. They held lightning in a bottle and then let it out. <laughs> I know, and they maybe used a bit too much weed killer. <laughs> you know, what's so crazy about this, Ashley? I don't understand. You 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 really helped me see that point in just absolute clarity. I was in Hollywood. I went to a show and I went to um, Swingers Diner in Hollywood, RIP. I think they closed down. And I remember we were just sitting there eating some grub and all the heads turned. And it was some guy who walked in with, and you might know who this was. I, don't, I couldn't identify him, but he had this, you know, flowing hair and this powered skateboard. And he walks in, all the heads are turning. I'm like, who is that? And it turns out he's this number one or number two viner yeah and i was educated really quick this is a viner and i was like mm-hmm. Ooh, ah. and it, it's not like that really stuck in my head because it, it's not as if vine wasn't getting tons of traction there were vine celebrities out there mm-hmm. and when they and when they closed down vine there were archive sites there was it was like it was like the death of a relative for a lot of people it, it absolutely was. A lot of those people ended up on YouTube, but of course, YouTube doesn't serve the same purpose. So when TikTok came out, a lot of the former Viners are now TikTokers. Oh, okay. Well, they, they just hopped across to the mm-hmm. next Vine. Yeah. But anyway, so I wanted to talk about technology and mm-hmm. 
there's such ready access to it and there's information and misinformation, so much flying around. Do you think that this has made news reporting easier or tougher? Oh, absolutely tougher, I believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, any not to impugn anything that we do, but anybody can start a blog with any name and report anything as news. And there's not really a way to verify that beyond just using your intuition and saying, hey, this doesn't quite seem right. Yeah, Paul, what do you think? You know, for us, it's 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 less of a of a concern, I think, because we're so dialed into a very specific audience. You know, mm-hmm. the minute we start writing words, it's we can use jargon, we can use uh, there's all sorts of information our audience already knows. So uh, it's not like we're barraged within our industry niche of we're not combating constant uh, fake news, but it's the music industry. So there's always going to be stuff. But one thing, one thing I've noticed is that over time, the people's ability to distinguish between what's obviously, you know, quote unquote, fake news and something legit, the sniff test has gotten a lot better. And this is just a, a process that's happened over a long period of time. Like, of course, you've got Snopes and you've got the occasional fake story that goes wild, but I'm noticing it. it's just happening um, far less frequently. People are are mainly dealing with reality and disagreeing about that, but not so much going down, reading an article and then not having any type of um, critical interaction with it. So speaking of the sniff test, is that how you source your stories or do you actually have any data or something else? Yeah, well, there, there are times when even, even if it passes a sniff test being like, okay, this could be real. If it's one source, it's, there's, it's very hard to leave forward with without enough information, uh, without uh, documentation, separate sources, um, a track record for the source is another great one. So yeah, there, there's just a lot of loose information that, that floats around. And, you know, sometimes people just make stuff up or they, maybe they're not intentionally lying, but they've drawn the incorrect conclusion and Live Nation isn't going to blah, blah, blah in two months. And they just think that, and it would be irresponsible or a bad idea to, to run forward with that. Yeah, for sure. Um, and Ashley, what about you? Is your sniff test alert on on high high up on the meter i'm i'm actually kind of lucky because i have paul's ear so if i come up (laughs) or find or run across anything that doesn't quite pass my sniff test i can pass it to him and say hey what do you think about this and again i have that input so there's two sniff tests going on when i source an article versus (laughs) when he does it's smelly Uh, yeah so paul's got a good sniffer got it um (laughs) where do you where do you source your news stories then do you have some like regular places that you go to you know a lot of it lands in our lap so uh, and of course we want to chase things and we we always go out and try to find things but we have so many uh sources coming at us and it, it might just be an sec filing so security and exchange commission we you know, we're alerted when something's filed because we've just set up the the feeds or the access or figured out how to do that. So I'll give you a, a perfect example. Um, this morning, this this is probably going to be a little bit dry, but it's very exciting for certain people in the industry, but <laughs> gotten alerted at like five something. Yeah, that's the other thing. A lot of the, a lot of the articles around are just boring to people. Okay. And I'm talking like all of my friends, anyone who does, and people within the industry, by the way. Um, but yeah, so we got an alert from the SEC. I think it was at like 5.30 in the morning. Warner Music Group has this dividend they're paying out. It's over $60 million. And hey, that's that's interesting. We can dig into that. And so that's something, you know, we we have the alert and the, the systems to connect to the SEC. Sometimes people just alert us. So they 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 want a story published. They yeah, they they'll know about the dividend, let's just say, you know, the call is amazing. Have you seen this filing? and go in and there it is. Okay. Or uh, did you notice that Warner Music Group posted these financial details? Did you check this out? Okay. So we go in, it's the, you know, SE form one, like, whoa, that's kind of interesting. So there's a lot of uh, sources, human (laughs) filings, all kinds of things that are just flowing. Um, Yeah. 
that would, would not come to, to another um, entity, I don't think. I would add to that on the tech side of things. We often watch patents and see what uh, mm-hmm. companies like Spotify, Apple, what all they're doing, what they're patenting. And even if these technologies never make it into the end user product, you know that they're working on that behind the scenes. And that's interesting enough to be reported on itself. We just got a patent filing mm-hmm. from Spotify and the yep. car thing. Yeah. It's called the car thing, I think. Yes, it is. And, the, <laughs> and from that patent filing, and they, I recently addressed it and made a blog post, they're potentially working on home devices like home thing and voice things. So those things might be coming before car thing does. We don't know. It's, it's mm-hmm. in the patents. I tell you, if I want to know anything, I'm just going to hit you guys up from now on. <laughs> Yeah, you can be the, you know, you you can be having the alerts come up a million times a day and you can filter it all through for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how about then um, the responsibilities to the community? Do you think that there are many for the news industry and do you think that they should be upheld more or strengthened? Ashley, you want to um, chime in? Yeah, I think so. Um, There's a lot of responsibility you have in reporting any news to being faithful to the industry that you're reporting in, but you also don't want to be so faithful that you're helping extinguish a voice that maybe is a little bit against the industry that is still relevant to the industry. So there's striking a fine balance between that and finding out what you want to report on that is accurate and is helpful to the industry without being necessarily a bad thing to have published you know what I'm saying you don't want to stray into the realm of quote-unquote fake news <laughs> all right so Paul nicely delegated to Ashley did, did you want I to would add something to that actually <laughs> which is I think reality is sometimes hard to report and I, it, I went absolutely and just yeah, jump yeah, absolutely exactly. <laughs> and I I really um went through this um let's just say there was there was a time when the music industry was was getting, uh, you know, on the verge of getting KO'd and they hadn't quite, you know, the physical formats were, were dying. Uh, audiences were everywhere. They weren't paying. There wasn't, um, it wasn't a real mechanism or way to engage music fans in a paid way. It just, the, 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 the industry couldn't get its footing. There was a lot of money loss. Um, there were a lot of very serious existential issues that were confronting the music industry, um, including the wide open question of whether or not even the major labels that that are thriving today would even be in existence. So that that was a very stressful time for a lot of people. So reporting on the realities of those situations would, of course, lead to like all sorts of blowback and all sorts of problems but it taught me that reality is 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 something i think journalists should try to stick with as much as they possibly can even though it's bad news uh oftentimes but um it does it breeds trust um it shows that you it, it develops your ability to just basically have a spine and push back on people um and hey when times are good you can report on great things too so I have to ask then, was there a, a time or an incident where you reported on something and then through through blowback, you realized your immense responsibility to the community? I will definitely. When when I was first getting started, I thought I I completely misreported <laughs> on a U2 album. I thought a U2 album was coming out like within a week. And I was like wow this is like nobody knows this. this is like the biggest thing and reported it and the information was wrong it was one of my earliest like real like real blows because i was like wait wait what how did i get this and so i really had to just dial back and retract and say this is bs i don't know when this album's coming out it turned out i was about three months off so instead of one <laughs> week it was about two months and three weeks so I wasn't completely wrong, but yeah, there's, there's, there are definitely, I think in any journalist's career or any publications um, lifespan, there are going to be moments like that where you just, you really just have to admit that the story was incorrect. What happened to your sniffer in that case? Yeah. Well, you know, I was developing it, you know, so <laughs> early in my career. <laughs> well, Ashley, before we break, do you have something you want to add to that one? Um. 
I will say that I have very quickly gotten responses from publication or uh, industry uh, companies who otherwise would not have addressed me if I've published something that they felt was, quote, misreported. I wouldn't necessarily say it was misreported, but uh, if that happens, I do correct those articles and make a note. And that's something that we've always done. So, you know, um, more frequently what happens is that the company just doesn't like the news. Exactly. That's, I like didn't want to there. put it that way, but yes. Right. <laughs> no, I, I would say, I would say, you know, nine times out of 10, that it's not an accuracy issue whatsoever. It's that it's, it's, it's a reality that if you report something great, it just nobody, blah, blah, blah. It's great. If you report something negative, if, um, you know, there's issues that, that will have material impact on a company, but it's, it's accurate, there will be blowback. So I, I think that you really have to stand your ground. If you know the information is right, you just have to, to, stand, to stand your ground. Yes. When we were reporting heavily on a bankruptcy with a company, I was in close contact with that company throughout that reporting process mm -hmm. because they always wanted to update anytime I published an article on what was happening, like, hey, here's what we're saying. And we publish that, but it does not edit the original article. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other the other thing that can really put this, you know, put lighter uh, fluid on this fire is that a lot of times the, the bigger the company, the more like PR people or uh, PR teams are involved. And then their mission becomes to spin the story, try to get a retraction. They'll do anything because for them, like that is the mission they need to accomplish. So you really have to step back and just realize that 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 is the mechanism. And you start to get used to that that sort of process. Um, and then once you kind of go through that a couple of times, you realize, okay, this is, there's a structure behind this. Mm -hmm. Amazing insights. And now a word from our sponsor. <laughs> I'm kidding. Back on now with Paul Resnikoff and Ashley King, our guests from Digital Music News. It's time for a little bit of fun, if you guys are ready. Uh, Paul and Ashley, we have a list of very hard-hitting questions for you. And, of course, we thought that the best way to answer them properly is to throw them at you in a segment that we call In Five Words or Less. Sound good? In sure. five words or less. Okay. <laughs> Oh, you guys are so nice. Okay, so I'm going to read out a list of questions and in five words or less, Paul will answer first and then swiftly followed by Ashley. And then next question, Paul, then Ashley and so on and so forth. All right. We're the ones that you're guinea picking this on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and it's so perfect, you know, because you guys are like hard-hitting writers and journalists and analysts. So <laughs> Great. All right. Are you both ready? Yes. We're ready. Here we go. First question. What was the first story you ever wrote? I cannot remember. <laughs> uh, that, I can go with less than five, right? Well, hang on a second. You've already broken format. What's going on? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I thought, I thought that's the rules of the game. Yeah, well, see, you went more than five words by asking a question, and then Ashley was supposed to come in, yeah? Isn't it like the clock ticking kind of thing? Wait, wait, wait. I thought it was five words or less, right? Yeah, but <laughs> then you said it in five words or less, and then you added something else in. <laughs> okay, wait. Okay, let me, let me, this is, wait, this is in beta stage, okay? So I get another chance. Uh, okay. I get another chance. <laughs> like, the, fine. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's go again. We're going to have to have a bloopers reel. All right. Are you both ready? I'm ready. Yes. Here we go. First question. What was the first story you ever wrote? I cannot remember. Uh, mine was about Android phones. What's the piece you're most proud of? Pieces about Spotify royalties. Is TikTok getting banned or not? Okay. Biggest faux pas in life so far. I'll take the fifth. <laughs> Said some things I shouldn't have. Come on, guys. <laughs> okay, moving on. If you're going to chicken out on me, favorite writing tool? WordPress. Another set of eyes to edit. What's your absolute must-have when writing? Strong brewed coffee. 
Oh, coffee, yes. <laughs> what did you want to be when you grew up? Firefighter. Park ranger. What did your parents want you to be? <laughs> A lawyer. Uh, cake decorator. Name your relaxation go-to. Music and golf. Lo-fi hip-hop. A major music artist was arrested at New Jersey's Gateway National Recreation Area in November last year for a DWI. Who is it? Bruce Springsteen. Oh, eh. <laughs> no, that was right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was one of my uh... there's another one <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah in the exact same spot um no that was right um did you know that one too paul yes yeah well ashley was the one that tipped me off to it yeah oh god i feel like i should have asked something harder you guys are journos so you you know <laughs> god damn it. not okay. to not to break the format but what wouldn't it be crazy if he was busted in a jeep <laughs> Yeah. Wouldn't that be crazy? <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you guys come up with that story today that he's been pulled from the Jeep ad now? Like for, was the Super Bowl? They had a Jeep ad and they've pulled it? Uh, yeah. I, yeah. They yeah. Did. Actually, you, yeah. Yeah. Did you guys okay. see the ad? Yes. I watched, I saw it live when it aired. I was watching yeah. the Super Bowl. So, uh, not to break format, but let's break format. Okay. Um, last couple <laughs> of questions. Who would you like to be for a day? Someone struggling in a third world country. Um, third world has a dash. <laughs> man, that's hard. <laughs> um, someone with an entirely different experience. Okay, I'll let that pass. <laughs> okay, why? Curiosity. Humbling perspective. Welcome back, everybody. We're here with Paul Reznikoff and Ashley King from Digital Music News. It's time for You Asked, where we answer questions from our community. It's very dramatic, isn't it? Uh, thanks to everyone who participated. Our first question is from Haley. Haley wants to know how to find the best person to contact at a media platform. I think that depends on the platform, but there are some general rules and guidance to, to think through. One is zero in a publication and try to figure out who's got beat or who's got the interest level or wants would be most likely to be interested and want to cover. So organizations, publications are often far more decentralized than you think. I'll give you a quick example. Within DMN, Ashley is constantly coming to me with ideas. So it doesn't have to trickle down from some editor or publisher or anything like that. Excuse me. So try to identify a target and go for that. There might be more than one, but don't feel like there is the editor you have to talk to. It's, it's probably rarely the case. Well, that's good to know. Ashley? Uh, most publications tend to have a contact form on their website, and I know that seems extremely general, but if you're just doing a general blast, you can hit people up there, and if you make your intro interesting enough, we'll probably read it. Ah, yeah, because you're always on the hunt for a good mm -hmm. story, right? Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, okay, next question. Um, Kristen and Chris have similar questions, and actually I think they've got similar names too. Uh, Kristen wanted to know how to approach a music journalist, and Chris wants to know how to pitch a music journalist. Ashley? Um, I've had people reach out to me on Twitter, which I don't object to. I have my DMs open for that reason, so people can, can contact me any way they need to. Um, as far as the pitch question, that kind of bleeds back into what I was saying earlier. Make your early pitch interesting. If I'm not hooked in the first two sentences, I'm not going to read your whole press release. 
So tell me the stats that you're telling me. Tell me everything that I need to know in a short five sentence summary that I can just skim and say, hey, this looks interesting or I pass. I think that's really important that that's it. You've got to really, if there's the whole, you know, investors talk about the elevator pitch, it's a mm -hmm. yes, widely yes. overused cliche, but it, it goes in, in other, it goes with journalism as well, because on the other side, just by the nature of what we do, we just get absolutely inundated with different story ideas, pitches, um, this artist, this, this release. And it takes a little bit of the fun out of it because we know that behind every email or every startup or every idea there's something interesting there's something going on but just from the practical vantage point of just hours and time and you have to pick a topic and go it's just impossible to to navigate it so short quick pitches that are interesting have a much better chance Absolutely. Yeah. If you have stats to share, tell me the stats up front. I'll go and look in the PDF and find them and see what you're telling me. If the stats are interesting enough to grab my attention right in the email. Beautiful. Keep it short, concise. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, next question is Roberto Del Salas, who wants to know how to write and present a press release to the media. I think we kind of answered that a little bit, um, but do you guys want to add anything to it? Uh, I, I would argue that you could stick to the big standard press release, like I said, if you're interesting in your introduction email. And your intro email doesn't have to be this professional, well put together. I mean, you want everything spelled correctly, but hit me with some data and, and some jargon that you normally wouldn't include in a press release because you're sending it and blasting it to everybody. I'm, I can handle that. I can process it. And if it's interesting, like I said, I'll read your, your, jar, your jargonless press release. You know, I would also add format is important because if you, if you're paying 10,000, 20,000 a month or whatever for a PR firm, they're going to know the format of a press release. Mm -hmm. It's, it's baked in. And then that becomes, uh, the, the sort of mode of communication. So if I open a press release, boom, I got, I'm, I know where things are and it's, it's, you don't have to go to a class to figure this out. Just read three or four and you'll start to really get the, the feel of it. And press releases are online. They're easily available. Uh, they, they, they have certain components. Um, they'll give you background on a company. Not everybody knows everything about your company. Not everyone has heard of your artist. Um, even very large artists or very large companies have that problem. Um, starts out with the, just the blocking and tackling. Starts out with a location, a date, quick intro to what's going on. Um, stuff like that it will elevate if you're at a a smaller level it'll elevate you to a bigger level if you're at a bigger level um then it's it's de rigueur and so it's 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 just important to have the right format i think mm. and um great because i was going to ask you about format um, is there a particular resource or a place that roberto or anyone else could go to that it would be a, more of a trusted source perhaps for a format you know, I, um, I would just say, um, Ashley, what were you going to say? Honestly, look at any company's press release, see how they've structured it, because that's like Paul was saying, they all follow a standard structure. There's a beginning, there's at the end, it'll tell you a little bit about all the companies that are involved, all the artists that are involved, the producers, whatever you have that involves a project, introduce everybody and make sure everything is is in a format that's easy to read and that's what companies are currently doing so if you look at another company's press release and you can break down the bare bones of it you know how to structure your press release how about tone because there's so many different ways to write would you say that you you take some of the cell out of it but you still have to have all the facts in there or, or what this is probably going to be extremely unpopular, but I much prefer dry press releases that get to the facts immediately that don't have a lot of flowery language and, oh, we did this, we did that. I mean, mm -hmm. that's great for you and all, but what does it do for me? <laughs> I mean, I'm the one reporting on this. I've got to report these numbers. I got to know if this is information that I want to report in the first place, because I come to Paul with ideas all the time and I don't do that unless I've researched the idea first. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Uh, this one is from George. He wants to know what is the best way to get attention from the media as an independent artist? My answer to that would be the same answer for how an independent artist would get attention from a major media company. And that is through traction and specifically 
stats and data. So if there's a story, there's a story. These days, you can't deny it. You cannot deny something that's going on. I can log on to, let's say, chart metric, and I can, I can see what's going on. I can see that there's, there's engagement, there's traction, there's interest. I can look up TikTok stats and be like, wow, this is really going on. Um, it's interesting. Ashley uncovered some really interesting things happening around the band Huba Stank on TikTok. And you can just see the data. It's right there. The story is there. And so that is, that's going to be interesting to publications. It's going to be interesting to other people. It's going to be interesting, interesting to Universal Music Group. A lot of people. They, it, 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 it tells a story. The data is going to tell the story. Mm. Anything to add there, Ashley? No, Paul's absolutely spot on. You just you can't really deny what's happening with data and what we get from massive rises in success. I mean, if you've created something that's popular and people are enjoying it on TikTok, they're sharing it, they're sharing it to Instagram Reels, it's blowing up, it's going to be there. We're going to see it and we're going to know about it. Amazing. Okay, this next one's from Zoe. Zoe wants to know if you should be focusing on getting local coverage or national slash international coverage. You know, I think the you is maybe you guys. Mm -hmm. I would argue that local coverage is important first because a lot of my news sources come from local blogs or not blogs, excuse me, local news like in Chicago or Philadelphia, local news channels that you otherwise wouldn't follow unless you live there. But when you put those sites on feeds, you can get news in that comes from around the country, but is tailored for your niche. So absolutely focus on the local scene if you need to, because if you make a big uh, splash in the local scene, then national will start to take notice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Paul? The only, the only thing I'd caution against is working markets where you really don't have something going on or you don't, you don't have the you know, boots on the ground or um, you really haven't built a presence there. So there's, there's a lot to be said for focusing on as Ashley was saying, I'm not, I'm not as um, endeared to um, the strategy in which you're only focused on Columbus, Ohio. Um, but I think it is dangerous if you're like, well, we're going to build Belgium now. Well, there has to be something going on there or some traction or some, some story there um, that is going to precede you before you start to, start to fling over to a, a market that's far away. Mm, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm going to mess up this next name. I'm sure of it. Rahul Kumar Prajabhati. Maybe. Um, Rahul wants to know, well, this is the way he's written it. New update of 2021, comma, I am confused. I don't think you're alone, Rahul. <laughs> so like what's cut through the fog of 2021? Is that the question? Yeah, I guess. And, you know, maybe from your perspective as news reporters and writers? I would, I would actually point to a lot of optimism that's, that's happening around the edges. So let's just take live concerts, for example. So there's, there are very few companies that have had it worse in the past year than Live Nation. They've had quarter over quarter revenue declines of 95%. If you look at their stock price, their stock price is actually back where it was pre-pandemic. And so, you know, you can always say, well, there's a lot of, you know, there's a gap between the market and reality, but actually, you know, there's, there's something going on there. There's a lot of healthy optimism about wanting artists getting prepared and companies getting prepared to return to the road. And there's endless amounts of pent up demand. I just read this morning, um, we just got an email actually from the weekends team that they, they're saying that they've sold over 1 million tickets to his upcoming tour. And the weekend doubled down, you know, he paid 7 million on top of $10 million for the, this, you know, very elaborate Super Bowl production. And that that's an investment. That's a bet on the future. And of course, not every artist is weekend the weekend. I get it. But that speaks to a lot of optimism that's out there about uh about this business coming back and good things happening. Yeah, that's I think, great. I think Paul's absolutely right. There seems to be a lot of optimism about when live music can come back. And that's a question I've seen asked. When will we be able to go to live shows again? When, when, when? Hmm. Well, I mean, that's a question that Dr. Fauci can answer. And he sort of has in some of the things that he said, but uh, 
the the sheer optimism in getting back to quote unquote normal, there's not going to be a normal end, and I don't think it's going to it's going to explode. It's going to be way more than normal, and then we'll have to settle back down to normal because once once everything is ready to open again and we're ready to go, it's going to be like a rocket taking off. <laughs> well, let me throw this little one in for you then. What would you not want to return to the normal from before? Ooh. In, within the music industry or in life in general? In general, maybe. Let's make it interesting. <laughs> Hair pulling traffic jams in Los Angeles. That's oh, right. man. <laughs> Luckily, that's, I don't have that awesome problem. <laughs> um, working from home has been pretty awesome, I'll say. I've really enjoyed that. Okay. All right. Good. Oh, I agree with both of those. Um, and I've seen my family so much more. Mm -hmm. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, very close to them yeah. now. Um, right. So what do you think will happen in the future of music, let's say 10 years from now? And this is from DGE. I think gaming will be a much, much bigger part of the music industry than what it is today. I mean, like I said, uh, artists are starting to treat games like tour stops that, no, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But 10 years in the future... I would say cryptocurrency might have a big uh, portion of the music industry too, because blockchain technology that powers cryptocurrency is really immutable. It's something that you can uh, put into ticket sales. It's something that you can control artist merch with. There's so many possibilities and applications that have not yet been explored, but I do think that's the future. Maybe not today, but 10 years from now. Yes, absolutely. Paul, do you want to borrow my crystal ball? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, the 10 years is really hard, though. What it's important, I think, to try to identify different changes and possible trends because it's really hard to tell. But we were speaking earlier about how it's important to to get to the punch, um, both in writing and then in, in pitching. And this is everywhere. So I think if you search what is the average length of a song, we have an article about mm -hmm. it that pops up to the top because so many people are curious like what is the average or it's either what is the average length 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 of a song or our song shorter now or something to that effect and it's it's fascinating because the length of a song of a of your average song has declined dramatically over the past certainly over the past 10 years definitely over the past 20 years i was taken aback i think it was a year and a half ago Kodak Black released an album with 24 tracks and one of the songs was a minute and 30 seconds, which that would have been filler. Again, let's, let's date myself, but that, that would have definitely been filler um, early 2000s. Like that would have been a, an interlude on, on a rap album nonetheless, <laughs> but it, it's, but that, that was a, a stand, that was one of his standalone songs. So you are seeing like that, that's an interesting trend. TikTok, it's it's there's not lengthy formats okay so let's put that over there but then wow there's the other side too there's the explosion of vinyl there's that's long form that's when you, you sit down you drink a wine and that's that's going to be a whole side a and that that is not a one minute and 30 second track so don't negate that right and these are that's another that that's been going on for 14 years is that going to go on for another 14 years i don't know but it's really important to keep your uh your eye on that and then all the changes that uh ashley was speaking upon with gaming that's i can't even imagine where that goes next but there's 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 so much fluidity now that th there will be dramatic changes i just i can't venture and say cryptocurrency i can't i can't say that i just don't know fair enough and I've noticed too that the introductions to songs are getting a lot shorter. I mean, once upon a time you could have eight bars of music, but now, hey, you know, you wait eight bars and everyone's fallen asleep. So who knows? <laughs> Ten years will be no intro. We'll be starting from the the end of the song. <laughs> go backwards. Yeah, it's Revolution Number Nine. Just <laughs> go backwards. <laughs> you got that one. Okay, cool. I love it. Um, okay. So I'm really going to not get this next name. Rohit Shri Symbol Star. So anyway, um, how do they feel when someone says he makes music on his phone? 
That's actually not quite the diss that it used to be, I would argue. I mean, don't get me wrong. We've got Neil Young on record saying that MacBooks and iPhones are Fisher Price devices. I don't necessarily agree with that. But when somebody says, hey, I do all of my compositions on my phone, that's uh, they've got some passion. And honestly, hardware is getting a little bit better. This, this, These things that we hold in our hands are actually becoming budget creation devices that not a lot of people would have had access to maybe 10 years ago. So seeing someone say, hey, I make music on my phone, it's like, great, keep going, see where you get from there. One thing I would say is I can I can listen to both sides of this this debate. I can listen to someone who says, oh, if this is not done on a professional Pro Tools rig and if if it's not EQ'd and it's it's just garbage, okay, fine, you know, great. But that negates that we've had enormous genres that have sprung up from basically and have have exploded despite basically crap quality. Okay. Um, it doesn't matter if it's SoundCloud rap, and I'm not trying to diss on SoundCloud rap, okay, but it's not the most carefully created format okay that's it's, part of its charm though because it feels so raw charm. i mean that's yeah. part of the genre at this point but it almost reminds me of like 80s punk or something right mm -hmm. it's like it's like oh my gosh like this is this is like the opposite of a music conservatory like a virtuosic you know playing but it's beautiful <laughs> for, because of that that's the reason why people mm -hmm. love it. yeah so there's, yeah there's an audience for everything and Absolutely. Everyone. There you go. Let's end it on that. Um, okay. Leon wants to know how to turn listeners into fans. Mm, that's a big one. <laughs> I'm going to say th th this is, this is difficult. Um, of course it's achievable, of course, but the, the trick it's gotten trickier because a song catching on with one song or engaging one song and getting on a marquee playlist is not the same as or necessarily the same as engaging with an audience so i think the perspective has to always be there that that your audience and your relationship with your audience is absolutely critical and will pay you the rich dividends in the long term there have been numerous um accounts and stories that i've seen in which an artist will get a marquee slot on a the chill hits playlist or something on Spotify, millions of listeners and their song is playing over and over and again. And they're, they're getting like nice royalty checks off of this. And those people cannot take that outside and reach their audience with that. It's not the same. It's not to say that that's bad. It just means that that needs to still be developed. So it's a perspective. And I just hope that artists that have that, traction can can learn from that try to get more playlist ads and then over time people start to turn their head and they go oh i favorited that track okay that's in my liked songs now like who is this guy oh cool okay then they're sort of they're in the section that is you know about that artist and like oh tour date okay it starts to develop it can take a lot of time um but it, it's it's always got to be a preeminent um consideration ashley anything to add there um, I would argue that it's pretty important to maintain a good social media presence too. I mean, I know a lot of artists don't necessarily want to put themselves out there that way. And if you don't, that's great. You can hire a team to do that for you. But if somebody searches or happens to run across your music on Spotify and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm curious about this artist. I want to know more. They're going to go to your Twitter page. They're going to go to your Facebook page. They're going to go to your Instagram. And if you don't have that, you're missing out on creating a fan. Yeah, and you just don't know when that opportunity is going to come. Absolutely. So, you yeah. can never predict it. So when you have it ready to go and you're keeping it updated, you're engaging with your fans, you're creating content for that, even if it's not necessarily music related, sometimes fans just want to know about you as a person. What are you doing in your life? What's happening to you where you live? Yeah, awesome advice. Okay, um, do you have time for a couple more? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. All right. Is it true that only songs with labels are pushed by media platforms on playlists? And there's no name for this, but the username is at dark. <laughs> we are just killing dark people's names. <laughs> yeah. I am really butchering them. But anyway, okay. So what do you think? I'm gonna answer this very bluntly. I think there is a lot of a lot of truth to that. 
and we have seen some disconcerting episodes very recently in which artists have found themselves yanked from Spotify playlists, independent artists, uh, emerging artists who are not repped by big labels. And the stated reasons have been that uh, there's fudgery going on with playlist adding services. A lot of this boils down to innocent mistakes from artists, but there is definitely an advantage that artists who are repped by big labels, larger indies, major publishers, major managers, they do now have a leg up um, to secure these plum placements. Not only that, if there's an issue, there are pros that can can swoop in. They're going to have connections to the playlist editors at Spotify. It's not it's not the greatest reality, but it is emerging as the as the industry is sort of congealing around the new platforms. There are a lot of power structures and advantages that are kind of going back to the big media players. Mm. Uh, Ashley, did you want to weigh in at all? Like Paul said, as an independent artist, you know, you don't have a big team working for you. And if you make mistakes against Spotify's terms of service that maybe you didn't realize as an independent artist, then you may be subject to that. And that's a reality that you have to deal with. Okay. Uh, all right. International song distribution, which is really quite open, is it? But this one's from Tesva Abisha Parapat. Hmm, I'm not sure what the question is, but do you guys want to talk about international song distribution? It's easier than ever. Dis distribution internationally is easier than ever. I'll just, I'm just, I don't know what the specific question is. I think the, the, and it's nice, I think as a proactive step, it's important to try to distribute your music in as many global platforms as you can easily do. Okay. That doesn't mean you need to be in a, um, cd rental store in tokyo okay because that's that's going to be really difficult but you can certainly be in spotify or apple music japan or something like that these are distributors can do this for you okay the reason i say this is because there's there's theoretically unlimited potential for you to be discovered to be added to playlists um to be picked up to to get get attention so so why not it, it's it, it's not, it's worth saving up for and distributing and maintaining, in my opinion. Mm, lovely. All right. So I've saved the best question for last. This one's from Leonardo. Why is Metallica badass? <laughs> oh. Ashley, are you a Metallica fan? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So do you agree with the statement, though? I'm was... just chuckling because... I mean, I, I, I guess I, I've, I'll, the only Metallica song I've heard is Enter Sandman and that's, that's it. <laughs> you know, that was their huge, massive crossover track. Mm -hmm. that that's, that's why I know it because that, that's, yeah. I've never been a metalhead. So that's not my genre. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's, what's absolutely crazy about Metallica, like Metallica to me is not a band. It's a corporation. Like if you, I, I once delved in and started to look at their tour and the reason i started looking is because james hetfield sadly was dealing with some addiction problems and part of it was being fueled by a lot of touring and the sort of machine that they created and so he needed to to hunker down and i think they canceled a bunch of dates this is probably last year or maybe a year and a half ago something like that but i started to look in and i thought you know what is this what is metallica inc the corporation what does this look like and it's an absolutely massive touring machine it's trucks it's um it's accountants it's logistics people it's absolutely insane and it's it's to me it's less of a um sort of a a group that has a following and more of like, you know what you're going to get. Like, it's almost like a beer, like, you know what it's going to going to taste like, you're going to buy it and it's going to give you that, that feeling. So, so that's why it's badass then <laughs> just bring you back to the question. It's a very, it's a very, it's a very loaded question, by the way, <laughs> but well, okay. Actually, you know what? Okay. I'll, I'll answer, I'll answer the actual question then. Cause I, I, Thanks for dialing back. 
Uh, sure, if you want to, that'd be great. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what there's another so if, if you dial back to Metallica's early history, like they there's a whole story about how they it's a really interesting story about how they fired Dave Mustaine and basically because of his they didn't feel like he was up to par quality wise and they were absolutely committed to this incredibly tight and musically perfect speed metal essentially right and so this was this is back before this was they were they were nowhere near mainstream they were growing and and they were you know a lot they were emerging of course and they, there was a, a tremendous amount of buzz but you know speed metal or extreme metal like what they were doing was by no means mainstream so they took their art very very seriously and they are incredibly driven um by it and so i think that's a that's a a very um common thread that i find and it's difficult because you know these aren't these aren't nine to five jobs this isn't um graduating from business school and then really putting everything into a career this is this is an amorphous artistic entity and so in the early stages it's really really difficult because they're they're undoubtedly going to be people that don't take you seriously they are actively discouraging you away from um, committing your energy and your perfectionism or your um, uh, your drive into into your art so that that has always impressed me about groups that that have gone on to really make it is that you dial back and you see a lot of incredible dedication when when really there aren't the fans and there there's there's it's uphill amazing answer and um he was probably just looking for because oh, their music is awesome <laughs> i can vibe i can vibe with that question by the way yeah, good, good stuff okay well look that brings us to the end of our questions paul and ashley thanks so much for your time i'm so glad we had this chance to chat yeah thank you this for is a blast me. This is a blast. was a blast next time with alcohol <laughs> hey you know i did tell you but you know i'm drinking alone here um to our viewers thanks for watching we hope you found this happy hour valuable and enjoyable as always let us know what you'd like us to talk about on these sessions be kind to each other cheers and we'll see you next time Bye.